high medicine prices, and all medicines are imported. I'm not talking about a future scenario. I'm talking about India in the 1960s. This was the situation in this country at that time. Um, when the Indian government actually looked at why this was, they identified patents, which are essentially, as everyone knows, monopolies on medicines, as one of the reasons why medicine prices were so expensive in, in India. Uh, we relied on a few producers from the West to import these medicines. In fact, I was reading up yesterday that this was a topic of conversation even in the United States in the 1960s, what few companies had control of medicines. Um, and the Indian government decided to take action on that, knowing that if we had to actually provide access to medicines, fulfill the constitutional mandate of right to health, you'd have to have local manufacture. You have to have a sustainable way of providing medicines in this country. And the Indian government, the Indian parliament took action on that. In the 1970s, we brought into place our version of the patent law or patent legislation, which identified food and pharmaceuticals as two areas where ma massive monopolies would not be provided. You'd have limited monopolies. And those monopolies would play in such a way that local industry and local technology could come up. That law, combined with industrial policy, combined with massive investment by the Indian government into health uh, research and development, led to, the India, to India having a booming genetic industry. But in 1994, something else happened. And that was a trade obligation. And that was the World Trade Organization being set up. And as part of the World Trade Organization being set up, there was something called the TRIPS Agreement, Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. The multinational pharmaceutical industry pushed very hard for this agreement. The Indian government with several developing countries resisted for a while but eventually gave in, thinking that they could maneuver themselves within that agreement to make sure that, that access to medicines would not be impacted. Um, India had up to 2005 to comply with this. 2005 comes around and the Indian Parliament starts discussing this and as Mr. Raja points out, suddenly the Indian Parliament, the Indian government is inundated by letters from Africa, from Asia, even from Europe. Why did this happen? Because about five years before that, the HIV epidemic or the AIDS epidemic had hit Africa and Asia and hit us in a very bad way. Um, this was a situation where millions of Africans literally died. And it wasn't a situation where treatment was not available. Actually, treatment had been discovered, medicines were available, but they were being produced by a handful of companies in, in, the, uh, in the United States and in Europe. The United States companies particularly, there was massive campaigns across the world begging these companies to provide these medicines, and they simply would not do it. The best price that people could get out of those companies was, I'm saying it in dollar terms because it might be easier to understand, was $10,000 per patient per year impossible for anyone in Africa, impossible for anyone in Asia. No government was providing treatment. At that point in 2001, a couple of Indian companies came up saying, you know, actually we have the technology to make these drugs and we are going to make them. And the first offer that they made of the price was $350 per patient per year. Today it's $60 per patient per year. It's a massive, massive fall in prices that's happened because of competition. It had a spin-off effect. Because what happened was, governments around the world suddenly started saying we can actually provide this treatment. And this is not one-off treatment. Huh? AIDS treatment is lifelong. You have to take it for the rest of your life every single day. But in 2005, when it became clear that India had to change its laws and we didn't know if the genetic companies could produce these medicines anymore, you saw protests around the world saying, you know, please make sure you can produce these medicines. The Indian parliament paid attention to that and they actually put into place health safeguards to make sure that as much generic production as possible could take place from India. Because we were still under the impression that we could play around within this international system. Several things happened. Many health groups, people living with cancer, hepatitis C, HIV, are in the patent offices, are in the courts, are before the government, making sure that firstly generic production continues because we know that generics or competition is the only way to keep medicine prices down. It's the only way for, the, for India to stay self-sufficient in medicines and asking the government of India to provide those medicines. So health groups across the country are very active on this. Despite that, despite us believing we could play around within the system, a massive number of patents have been granted. And we're in a situation now that we're looking at prices that we never thought impossible, within our lifetimes at least. Uh, maybe people around in the 1960s remember how bad it was then, but I certainly, I mean, it's very hard to believe that a hepatitis C medicine today, which has been patented in India, is between 500,000 to 700,000 rupees. And Pratibha will tell you, there are friends of ours who we've lost. They have just, I mean, we've lost them. We have died fighting. 
This is not a situation where we have health safeguards, an Indian generic industry, and health groups fighting tooth and nail to try and get access That's to medicine. medical tourism. Medical tourism, yes. This is another, another side of medical tourism. The second thing that started happening is that Indian companies are being taken over. If you can't, you know, the, the old saying goes, if you can't let them join them. Because for Western multinational companies, they've tried every other way, they haven't succeeded. They're looking at genetics as, as another way to start business. So, Brand Vaccine is a Japanese company. Dabur and Orchid are French companies. Uh, some of you have entered, I think, with them over. Shanta Biotech, a big vaccine producer, not an Indian company anymore. Nicholas Piramal is a US company now. It's owned by Abbott. Third thing that's happened, massive litigation. Roche, Novartis, Bio, three European companies have tied up the Indian government in the Supreme Court. Litigation after litigation on these health safeguards. From the frying pan into the fire. And what the European Commission is demanding is longer patent terms. We already have to provide patents for 20 years. The European Commission wants longer terms than that. What the Indian law basically does is it, it has certain health safeguards that says that unless your medicine is genuinely new, unless it's a real deep in technology, you're not going to get a patent in this country. Because what we've seen abroad is that a company will take two medicines, combine it into one pill, apply for a patent on that. Take that pill, turn it into a syrup, apply for a patent on that. It's called epithelium. The Indian government said, we've got the benefit of hindsight, we've seen what other governments have done, we are not going to do this over here. So what's happening is that a lot of the Western companies are finding that they're not getting patents in, in the country. So they're trying to create a new monopoly, which is called data exclusive. Which basically what they're saying is, if we conduct clinical trials, we'll give that data to the Indian Drug Regulator, our Drug Controller General of India, and once he gets that data, he can't uh, approve of another generic medicine. So they're creating a separate monopoly. They're saying if you can't get through a patent, we'll get it through another way. Enforcement, what Shalini mentioned, um, our courts are very active, and every time a battle has come up on medicines before then, they have looked at the constitution, and said, well, actually, we can't keep generic medicines out of the market. We make them pay you a certain amount if you deserve a patent or if you have a patent, but we're not going to keep them out of the market. This agreement tries to lessen the ability of our courts to do that. The other thing it does is it attacks everyone up and down the chain. Right now, if a patent is infringed, you are a generic company. This allows them to get information from your chemist, from the guy who manufactures your packaging, from the guy who supplies it by truck, all of them, you can ask them for information as to how, how your patent was infringed. Which means tomorrow your chemist is not going to carry that medicine and your truck driver is not going to supply it because he can get caught in a case because of it. So these are three or four things that are happening. And the fourth thing is the investment chapter. Uh, that is a serious concern that they're going to define investment to include intellectual property rights. And I'll just give you one example to show you that it's not theoretical how intellectual property can impact health and how you can be sued. Uruguay. Um, and this has not got to do with access to medicines, introduced a policy of putting pictorial warnings on their cigarette packets. You know, something that the government of India is also considering, to have health warnings on cigarette packets. They have been sued under an investment treaty by Philip Morris, which is a tobacco company, saying that their trademark is being violated. Okay, trademark is the name Philip Morris, right? Philip Morris is saying that I own that trademark, I should be able to place it on my tobacco packet, whichever way I want, and you can't ask me to put pictorial warnings on it. Now, if this came to a court of law, any court of law would throw this case out, saying that this is a matter of health, and therefore you will comply with it. But because it happens under an investment treaty or a free trade agreement, it goes into a quiet arbitration and no one finds out what happens. Philip Morris did this to Canada as well. The Canadian government threw up their hands in fear and said, okay, okay, okay. We won't try and regulate how you package your cigarettes. You go ahead and do whatever you want. And that was on a separate matter of using the word mild. So there is serious concern that when you start providing these investor rights in free trade agreements, it impacts medicines, it impacts health. So what are we going to do with the second trade agreement? Uh, Mr. Raja, you got calls from Africa at that time. Right now, in the last three months, there have been massive protests, starting from Delhi, where we have faced violence by the police. Uh, up to Latvia, Indonesia, Nepal, Cambodia, Thailand, because these are all countries that get their medicines from India and are worried about it. These are also countries that are negotiating with the European Union and they're worried that their governments will give in on it. 